Confusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we inject weird and wonderful science directly into your brain. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Stephen Freeland talks about why we need space law. But first up, here's the news. Young blood needed. Following up from last week's story on vampire mice, the race is on to commercialise the discovery that old blood may cause harm and young blood may promote healing in the brain, heart, liver and muscles. There are two players in California who are trialling two different kinds of treatments to restore youth. One of them pays young people to give some of their blood to older customers, creating the market I warned about. The other dilutes levels of proteins in old blood to be more like the levels of those proteins in young blood. The Ambrosia Company in California, co-founded by its chief investigator Jesse Carmazan, isn't bothering with double-blinded controlled clinical trials. They're jumping straight into injecting plasma from young people into anyone willing to pay $8,000. Well, anyone over the venerable old age of 35. There's no evidence yet that this treatment will do anything at all. That's what well-designed clinical trials are for like the Alcahes trial giving young plasma to people suffering Alzheimer's disease. In the Ambrosia Pay for Participation clinical trial, there'll be no controls who aren't given young plasma, so we can't know if there's a placebo effect in the results. Dr. Karmazin says he can't use controls because he can't charge people $8,000 for the chance that they might get a placebo. Ambrosia's trial is registered with clinicaltrials.gov, the US government website for tracking human clinical trials and their results. In Ambrosia's trial, 600 people aged over 35 would receive 1.5 litres of plasma from a donor under the age of 25 for over two days of treatment. Before the infusions and one month after, their blood will be tested for more than 100 biomarkers that Ambrosia claims vary with age from haemoglobin level to inflammation markers. Critics say the biomarkers don't tell you much about age. The US Food and Drug Administration regulates the collection and manufacture of blood and blood components in America to protect the health of the blood donor and also to ensure the safety, purity and potency of the blood product. While it's not approved specifically for anti-aging treatments, like other drugs, it can be prescribed for off-label uses as long as there's no advertising or efficacy claims involved. This would seem to be a problem for Ambrosia. So while it's officially a clinical trial, they can source their blood from blood banks. But once the trial is over, getting young blood for customers may be more difficult. Google company Calico in California is looking at correcting what their lead researcher, Professor Irina Comboy, sees as bad changes in the proportions of different proteins in older blood. People in the clinical trial will have their blood passed through a pump that will filter out excess proteins to bring them down to the levels of what would be seen in blood from young people. They plan to start clinical trials in the second half of 2017. In November 2016, they published their research in the journal Nature with the title, A Single Heterochronic Blood Exchange Reveals Rapid Inhibition of Multiple Tissues by Old Blood. The race also goes international. At Pondang Cha Hospital in South Korea, where the researchers are performing a study that looks at the effects of stem cell rich umbilical cord blood and plasma infused into people aged 55 and over. The phrase, this organisation needs some young blood, has taken on a much darker meaning. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. And now, the law in space. Stephen Freeland is a professor of international law at Western Sydney University. Professor Freeland is an expert on space law. I began by asking him 
what are the basics of space law? Well, firstly, we need to understand why we need law at all in space. If you were speaking to someone in the street and you said there's this thing called space law, they would probably think that would be about dealing with aliens. The reality is that every society, be it in industrialised countries or less industrialised countries, is dependent upon space technology every day. Every aspect of our life is affected by space technology. Space is therefore an incredibly important component of the functioning of societies. So from that perspective, countries are dependent upon it, communities are dependent, individuals are dependent upon it. It's also a highly strategic area because it gives rise to a whole lot of opportunities to create competitive advantages. It's also, sadly, used very significantly in military aspects and is associated with national security. And it's also a very commercialised area. So there are many, many space actors, commercial private entities who are making a lot of money, investing a lot of money and making a lot of money in space. As a result, therefore, it's a very important domain which we need to manage. So we need to manage it through uh, a management regime of law. So then the question becomes, well, how do we do that? So the first human-made space object that orbited the Earth was in 1957, an object called Sputnik 1. And what happened at that time already International law, which is typically reactive to technology, had for a long time calculated that airspace, the airspace above a country, was essentially part of its territorial jurisdiction. So I can't fly into New Zealand's airspace without its permission. So it's, New Zealand law applies in New Zealand airspace. All of a sudden now we had this object, Sputnik 1, that was launched from the former Soviet Union and then went to an altitude, I can't remember, but about 300 kilometres, and then started circling the Earth. And it circled the Earth for, I think, about three months. And clearly, it overflew countries. So, surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, countries did not complain. They did not say, you're trespassing. They did not say, you need our permission. They did not say, get off my land. And so very quickly it was recognised that there's something above airspace. So we shall, for present purposes, call it outer space. And there's something above airspace which is beyond territorial jurisdiction. So that the airspace above Australia is within Australia's jurisdiction, Australian law applies. The outer space above Australia, which is above the airspace, is beyond Australian law. So, very quickly it was recognised that this animal that we'll call it out of space had a different legal categorisation. So we had to work out what that meant. Once you work that out, once you decide that, and as I said, it was agreed quite quickly that national law did not apply in space. Once you work that out, you then have to work out, well, what do we do next? Do we regard this area as an area of no law? that nobody has a stake in. We could call it, if you wanted to use Latin, a res nullius. If you do that, then no law can be created, at least by the international community, and therefore there's nothing to, in a sense, defend that area from pollution, from all sorts of nefarious activities. A parallel to space on Earth is like the high seas. Imagine if the high seas, which is again beyond territorial jurisdiction, Imagine if that had no law applying to it. Then every country would sail to the high seas and dump all their nuclear waste and destroy it. So that approach to managing this new area called space is unacceptable. So the alternate approach is that one regards outer space as an area that belongs, in a sense, to everybody. In Latin, we would refer to a res communis. Therefore, Everybody has a stake in it, so it's not owned by you or me or anyone else. It's owned by everybody collectively, in the sense globally. Then we all have a stake in it. We can all create laws to, in a sense, regulate the use of that area. That's what we've done with the high seas. So, in fact, there's much international law, not national law, international law by way of treaties, saying that you can't dump your nuclear waste in the high seas. Likewise, with outer space, there's much law about how you act in outer space. So we have an international framework. Now, the international framework applies to countries. They are bound 
by the treaties. You and I as individuals or private enterprises are not bound by treaties. So in the early days of space use, it was mainly countries that went to space. It wasn't really anticipated that private companies would go to space because in those early days, remember we're talking about the Cold War, we're talking about really significant military tensions. Space technology was by and large developed by the Soviet Union and the Americans with military eyes. But that technology, which is also used for military purposes, then began to be spun off for commercial purposes as well. So over time, if you fast forward to now, there are many, many private entities in space. They're not bound by treaties, yet the countries who had jurisdiction over are bound by the treaty. So Australia, as a party to these space treaties, has various obligations. So therefore, it's in Australia's interests, as it is in most countries' interests, to pass national law to regulate Australians, who go to space to make sure that they're doing the right thing, to regulate them, to clearly make sure they're not breaching national security interests, but also to make sure that Australia, the country, is itself complying with its obligation. So you have an international layer that regulates space, and then by and large, you have a national layer of law. So in Australia, we have the Space Activities Act and one or two other that regulate the private actors that want to go to space. So we have these two layers of law. Because I know that over the decades, people have tried to claim, well, there's various organisations that try to claim that there's old Roman space law saying, you know, it goes up to the sky. So the moon, they're trying to sell property on the moon because we own it because it's part of the sky. But of course, that doesn't apply. Yeah. So one of the fundamental principles in this international framework of space is what we call a non-appropriation principle. And it says that no one can lay claim to space. You can't, states can't claim sovereignty. And as a result of that, and as a result of the fact that national law itself doesn't apply in space, you or I as individuals, I mean, we can say whatever we want, but legally we can't ourselves say, well, we own the moon and therefore we can sell it. I mean, we, I, I'm aware country companies do this. In fact, my students once as a present bought me an acre on the moon, so-called acre on the moon. Clearly, it's a novelty value, but if legally, it has no value. So that is not permissible. And one of the really important reasons why we have this non-appropriation principle is that if you look on Earth, in the past, many of our wars and conflicts have been as a result of colonisation intentions and trying to get resources and things like that. And very early on, even though we're in the Cold War, the two protagonists in the Cold War obviously were at ideological differences, but they were both the major space powers. And they both very quickly recognised that it's in neither of their interests to allow for a colonisation of space, because all that would do ultimately would be to exacerbate the possibility of war and conflict. So this non-appropriation principle, it stops you and I claiming the moon, but it also has a much broader and important thing that space really is a global commons. It's, as I said, internationally, we all have a stake in it, but it also doesn't allow for colonisation. And therefore, at least until now, that has minimised the possibility that we'll have conflicts in space about, well, th th that belongs to me or that belongs to me. So that's really a positive thing. NASA's talking about colonising Mars. <laughs> Yes, I mean, the word colonising is an interesting one. Obviously, as our technology moves on, people come up with ambitious plans. And that's exciting. Some of those plans, perhaps, in my view at least, follow the wrong priorities, but it, it, these decisions are made by others. But a lot of people are of the view that, and, and Stephen Hawking, well-known astrophysicist, has said the future of humanity is indeed away from Earth. Now, I'm not sure I necessarily agree with that. But if you follow that line of thinking, a lot of people think that the future of humanity in centuries from now will be that we need to be permanently inhabiting outer space. Now, we already in one sense have humans permanently in space through the International Space Station. Part of its mission is to be permanently inhabited. But that's in a sense a one-off, it's an ad hoc thing. And the ISS itself has a limited lifespan and we're not sure what will happen after that. But the idea of sending humans to the moon, to Mars, whatever, I mean, these are exciting. These projects have to be developed by NASA and other agencies to gain excitement so that the politicians will give them their budgets. We understand all of that. 
The idea, though, of having human settlements in space is not necessarily the same thing as saying that a country, let's say America or Russia or China, is actually claiming space. You know, 300, 400 years from now, whenever that is, and we do have people living in space, if indeed that happens, and again, one has, you know, I'm not entirely convinced, but, but I remain to be convinced, in the end, we'll have to create, in a sense, a whole new legal regime. We'll have to create specific laws about people living in space. You know, they'll want to get married, they'll want to have kids, they'll kill each other, you know, they'll do all the things that communities do on Earth. And it's inappropriate to try to have ad hoc laws borrowed from here to apply to that. So it's not as if America is moving to the moon or Mars or whatever. If and when, more likely if, we ever get to that point where we have serious settlements in those places, then in a sense it'll be a whole new ball game, and we'll just have to wait and see how that works out. So how does that apply when companies want to claim asteroids for mining? That's an excellent question. And of course, there are many challenges, but that is an interesting perspective. There are now many companies who the technology has improved and our understanding about the physiology of celestial bodies has come to the point where a lot of people think there's there's gold in them, there are hills, as the old expression goes. And there's excitement, therefore, about this exploitation of resources, the natural resources of space. Now, we've been exploiting natural resources of space for a long time. We've been exploiting orbits for a long time. They are natural resources. There's some really valuable orbits, and we've been exploiting it. And to exploit it, in particular, one really important orbit known as the geostationary orbit, which has got particular characteristics that make it extremely valuable. We've been exploiting that ever since Arthur C. Clarke came up with the notion and we were able to get satellites there in the early 60s. We have a management regime for that through what is known as the International Telecommunication Union. So there's a regime that sort of works it out and the regime works hand in hand with the international rules we have, particularly the non-appropriation. There's, you know, you could, you have to be pragmatic in how you manage it, but it's managed and it works reasonably well. If and when we get to the point where the technology will exist to extract on a large commercial basis resources from asteroids or whatever. My own view is this, and and people disagree with me, but my own view is when it really gets to the point where this becomes real and there are many technological, financial, political, diplomatic, scientific, you know, all sorts of challenges still to be overcome, but let's assume that humans being the resource for people they are, we can overcome most of those. When it really gets to the point where this becomes a real issue, this is bigger than any one company. It's bigger than any one country. It's at that point that I seriously believe that the major countries and others would sit down and say, okay, now this is a real thing. We're talking about exploiting for real benefits an area that legally belongs to all of us, although we understand that only certain countries can do these things, but still, we have to work within that framework. And I honestly believe, although people have regarded me a bit of, as a bit of an optimist, that when it push comes to shove and we really get to that point, and I still think we're a long way from there, despite what private companies say, that the, the main players will sit down and will work out some international cooperative rules. Uh, in the meantime, however... It's an issue on the international agenda. I have the privilege of representing Australia at UN meetings. There's a UN committee on the peaceful uses of outer space, which meets three times a year. I have the privilege of representing Australia in the legal subcommittee there. And the issue of extracting resources is on the agenda for that, okay, for discussion. But the fact that it's on there for discussion doesn't mean it's lawful. (laughs) It doesn't mean that resolutions or solutions will come up quickly. So the international framework moves quite slowly until, because international law is by and large reactive, until, as I said, it really becomes a real thing. In the meantime, however, private industry wants to get on with this, right? So you found in the United States, for example, where a lot of this technology is being developed, private industry has been lobbying the US Congress. And late last year, President Obama signed into law a, a US law that said and I'm paraphrasing, if a US company goes to an asteroid and extracts, then it has ownership rights of those resources subject to, and this is the big thing, subject to US law and international law. 
okay? And a lot of people forget that those last few words. So international law will still apply. Remember, we had this non-appropriation idea. Why did the US do that? Well, the US did that because there was, they were lobbied by these industries. Why These industries can now go away to their investors and say, see, look, this is a real thing. Look what the US law says, right? But the fact that the US law says what it says, and again, subject to international law, is a long way from saying that permission will be given to do these things. But the industry, in a sense, has had a win because they can now raise capital much more easily to say, hey, this is a real thing. But, you know, I go back to my remarks before. That's a long way from saying this is going to happen and it's going to happen by private companies just going up there and doing what they want. I sincerely believe that's not going to happen, albeit we run the risk that there's a momentum on that. So already Luxembourg has followed suit with the Americans. They are now supporting these industries. The United Arab Emirates, who are developing their space policy of very, very enthusiastically looking at space resource mining. But all of that will add pressure to the fact that this is becoming more real. And so I think, again, uh, ultimately, there will be an international cooperation on the rules because this is too big. If there isn't, then we run real risks because then you do start having possibilities of conflict arising out of, well, that's mine, no, no, that's mine. And obviously that's something we need to avoid. Would this non-appropriation possibly lead to some sort of resource tax that's spread throughout the world? Because if it's a commonwealth, just like the minerals in Australia belong to the people of Australia, and so the mining companies pay for the resources when they mine them, they pay the Australian government on behalf of the people. Would it be something like that? That's, that's a fantastically interesting question and I've written about this because what we're trying to do is on the one hand we have the non-appropriation principle on the other hand we already have a treaty although it's not well supported which actually contemplates this contemplates exploitation and says that you can take stuff away and so in a sense one's got to reconcile the fact that you can't claim space for yourself with Another treaty, space treaty, as I said, not well supported for other reasons, but another space treaty that says, yes, we can extract. And the way that I've thought about with with some colleagues reconciling that is exactly as you say. There are parallels with mining leases on Earth. As you say, mining in Australia, the natural resources of Australia belong to the people of Australia. Okay, That's an international law principle. It's part of the permanent sovereignty of Australia. Australian government or the state governments then give licences to private companies not to own the minerals but to exploit, sell for a fee, which is royalties, okay? And in a sense, the ownership issues don't really arise. I mean, I know it sounds artificial, but that's really what happens. And you can apply, even though I think we're a long way from there in reality, but what we've attempted to do is apply the same sort of ideas for space to say, the natural resources of space, which are expressed to be this political concept of the common heritage of mankind, they remain, if you like, part of this global community. Eventually, when all the countries get together and work out, okay, how how are we going to manage this? They'll have, there'll be a management regime representing the global community that would issue, again, licenses to appropriate, to exploit and, i.e. extract, and then utilise that. But because the resources are always belonging to the global community, part of that, and this is expressed in this treaty, is that in some way, shape or form, benefits derived from that exploitation should be some way shared amongst everybody. Now, that's the big sticking point. That's why this treaty, which exactly covers the point, a treaty that was put together already in 1979, was not supported by the industrialised countries because they resist this idea of sharing benefits. But ultimately, and again, I'm, I'm optimistic, but I think I'm realistic. Ultimately, in the end, if this is to happen because it's so big and so emotional, giving rise to so many emotions, ultimately there will, I believe, be some regime where if this is to happen and licences are given, some way, in some way, shape or form, the benefits from that, and they don't clearly don't need to be financial, will somehow dissipate amongst everybody. Not equally, but in by no means. And obviously, risks, capital risks, and are taken by people who go there. But we'll have to find a way. We just have to find a way. But I think we will find a way. 
That was Professor Stephen Freeland from Western Sydney University talking about space law. You can hear more from Professor Freeland on Australia's 2016 review of space laws in episodes to come. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Would you like to hear your voice on radio? Go to the website and click the tab on the right to send a voicemail to be played on air. Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. And please do send me an email so I know you're listening and you'd like to hear more episodes. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Have a look at the Patreon page at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. Checking production was Charles Willock. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia on the Community Radio Network, including 8 C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambucca Valley, and 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation Science 360 Internet Radio Station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website www.diffusionradio.com that's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, then you can explore more than 900 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolfe. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio.